Welcome, Anna. Thanks for joining us. I believe you just came back from work. I did. I did. Another long day in the office. Oh, wow. And uh, do you have your friend with you? My friend? Well, her name's Daisy and she is, well, kind of joining me. She's looking out the window. Oh, how cute. <laughs> how old is Daisy? She just turned eight recently. Oh, wow. That's awesome. And have you had Daisy for very long? I've had her for about half of her life now. I adopted her when she was four. And the first time that I got her, I actually was babysitting her um, through a friend that was fostering her. And over that weekend, she stole my heart. So here she is. Oh, that's awesome. And um, so I've got you on here today to join us because you are actually a veterinarian. Yep. Yep. And how is that like? Being a vet, um, well, it all started with, you know, my mom was actually the one that influenced me to look overseas at vet schools, um, just because in the States, there's a lot of class requirements and you have to have all this experience and high GPA, like grades and everything. And I still have about a year or so to go just for the States those type of schools. And when I was finishing up my undergrad, my mom was like, oh, look overseas, like the Caribbean or somewhere. And Australia was the first place that popped into mind. Looked into Melbourne. And Melbourne was accredited for North America, just in case I wanted to go back in the future. And applied and got into Melbourne. Ended up doing my veterinary degree there. And love the city so much, love the country so much. Here I am, permanent resident working as a full-time vet and being a vet day in and day out, you have all the ups and downs that you expect, but overall it is a very satisfying career choice and the love of animals just keeps going every day. Oh, wow. That's so cool. Um, and so you're joining us today for National Science Week um, and I am representing the Australian Society for Parasitology because I am actually a parasitologist. Um, which means I study parasites. Um, you had to study parasites as well to become a vet. Is that right? Definitely. I believe we had a full year's worth of lectures about all different types, the insides and outs, um, just to learn and through all major seven species as well, plus to learn about all the different types of parasites that we may or may not run into over our career. Oh. I'm, I mainly deal with dogs nowadays and with some cats, um, but a lot of the other vets that work more rural would deal with a lot more herd-based animals like cows, horses, sheep, things like that, um, chickens, and with the dogs and cats in the world. Um, luckily, there's a lot of products out there that help treat many different parasites. Um, a lot of them are all-in-one products as well, which is helpful, and through clinical experience, um, when you ask owners what products they use to control fleas and intestinal worms and heartworm, they're all over it. They're, you know, on top of it each month or every three months, they're treating their animals against these parasites, which helps us in the long run to um, figure out what may be going on with their animal if they do become unwell, because that's one of the first questions we ask is, what parasite control do we do you use so we can help rule out in or out what may be going on. So it's definitely a very important aspect of the job. Luckily now in our day and age, a lot of people are on top of it and it's much easier to figure out what's happening in the uh -huh. fur babies world. <laughs> oh, that's cool. Yeah. Um, I've just got a friend of mine that's joined me. Up, 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 I don't know. Hey Archie. Hey, hey bud. Ah, <laughs> that's a good man. So if I'm um, a dog owner as I am with my dog, Archie, um, what sort of uh, advice do you give to people like me about good parasite control? <laughs> um, if you can find something that is easy to remember, that's easy to give, whether it's a spot on skin treatment or a chewable or a tablet, each dog's different in their own. Um, to stay on top of it, uh, monthly or depending on the product three monthly or six monthly um, to prevent fleas, ticks, lice mites, 
and all the different intestinal worms that may even um, not harm us, but distract us as well. So. Um, now I believe Anna, you've actually got a little presentation that we're going to talk through today. And that really details exactly what it's like to be you, be a vet um, in a small practice. So you, what does um, a vet being in a small practice actually mean? Well, with the clinic that I work with, um, it is a family owned clinic. So we do get very um, personalized with our clients and their pets and we can talk to them um, safely and soundly in any type of environment to inform them what may or may not need to happen depending on what's going on. Um, we are able to, you know, yes, it's always good to try to practice gold standards, but in reality, it does come down to what's best for the client and the patient at that time. So you can give them all these options to choose from and not have to worry about, you know, KPIs or business side of things in that aspect. It's more about that full heartedly treating to make that animal feel better and get better on the right foot. Oh, cool. Um, so I'm going to share the presentation now. Cool. So I am going to, um, flick through this presentation with you and you're going to um, talk to us about what it's like being a vet. Um, so this is obviously titled The Life of a Veterinarian by Anna Donlan. Um, and the uh, vet here is saying, I'm a dog, dog tour, practicing meow missin. Is that how you say it? <laughs> yeah, it's more of a pun than anything, just to get it more um, relaxed and um, friendly with the animal side of things. Awesome. W little wordplay. <laughs> <laughs> Did you come up with it? Or? Uh, it was kind of one of those things that we'd say during during vet school as we we're going through the years, especially the third and fourth year, the last two years of school. Um, you know, you start going into placements and seeing and hands-on experience going through um, cases and talking to the vets and getting that world experience. So here we would come back together once in a while and um, chit chat and make jokes and being like, I'm a doctor. <laughs> <laughs> and changing right. the wording a little bit. <laughs> <laughs> okay, let's get into it then. Um, so this is obviously who you are. Um, so you did mention earlier that you are originally from the US. So whereabouts in the US originally? I'm from Wisconsin. It's considered in the Midwest. Um, I'm not sure if you guys know where Chicago is, but that's one of the big cities in the States. Um, and we are the state just north of Illinois um, along the Mississippi. So I don't know, can you see my mouse? Yep, if you go a little bit to the right. This way? A little bit more. And yep, that would be where Wisconsin is. Oh, here. Wow, so that's pretty, does that get pretty cold sometimes? Yeah, we get all four seasons and we get a lot of snow as well. <laughs> oh, wow. <laughs> and um, you might have said it earlier, but so why did you decide to come to Australia to be a vet? Well, first off, um, during my undergrad years in Minnesota, which was the state just west of Wisconsin, um, I was doing my undergraduate in wildlife biology. And I've always wanted to be a vet. And during that time, it was so many class requirements while playing two sports as well. I was already in almost finishing my fifth year of undergrad. And my mom actually convinced me to look overseas like the Caribbean or elsewhere to see if I can get into vet school there that I've already had all the requirements covered. So I looked in Australia and that's always a place that any American would want to go. And <laughs> Why not hit two birds with one stone with going to school in Melbourne as well as visiting Australia and really getting immersed in the country and the culture here. So I applied to Melbourne, got in, and here we are. Wow. All right. And so how, what is the pathway of becoming a vet? So there's many different ways. Being an international student, um, I did have to complete my undergrad courses in my country, and then I applied to the graduate courses at Melbourne or any of the other vet schools in Australia. And then it becomes either a four-year or five-year um, 
doctor doctorates or a bachelor's i believe it's what's recognized here um, for schooling if you were from australia i believe with melbourne's program anyways you can either do the fast track with it which is six years long first half is your undergrad years and the second half is the veterinary medicine course and that middle um, third fourth year is kind of a um, half and half year where you're half in the program, half finishing your undergrad courses. Um, otherwise, you can finish your undergrad courses fully and then go into the full, the four year veterinary course as well. Cool. So you gotta get really good grades. Um, it's definitely one of those high requirements. So work hard and study hard. But once you do enter the course, there's a lot to learn, a lot to take in, and it's being able to just pass <laughs> put it simply um and so i obviously there's a lot of science involved um when you're studying to be a vet definitely definitely so you do have to learn a lot of biology all the different chemistries um some physics and you don't get more into the i guess medicine side of things until you're actually into the course so learning the pharmacology and things like that um is more in the veterinary medicine side of things, but all the science classes that you can think of, um, most likely you have to do to be able to get into veterinary medicine. Cool. And is that um, Daisy that we saw earlier in that photo? That is, she's giving me a little head hug on the table. How cute. <laughs> yeah. And that's <laughs> Gus in the other picture. He was one of the university horses that was very photogenic. So oh, he's very lovely. Okay, so this is obviously highlighting that you did your um, your veterinary degree at the University of Melbourne. Um, yep. Looks like you had a lot of fun there. Yeah, so these are different pictures that I was able to capture um, while I was doing my third and fourth year placements during school. Um, so the one on the left is a husky that has megasophagus. He was born that way. So he has his own homemade high chair <laughs> in a sense where oh. when he, um, has his meals he can either eat his meals sitting up like that so gravity can help him um, get the food all the way down to his stomach but he was a special case because he had a surgery that actually had a little tube that went straight to his stomach from the side of his abdomen so you can physically syringe food straight into his stomach without him even eating it so that made the risks of him getting um, aspiration pneumonia a lot less likely and a lot safer in in general yes it was probably an expensive surgery but it made his life a lot easier overall um, the picture in the middle was elephants from Thailand I was able to do a placement up that way that was really fun um, great experience to work with some wildlife and a creature that you know from coming from the States and even from Australia they're not native to here. So being able to see them in their natural habitat and help them like heal them up from either landmine wounds from old war, um, war injuries. Um, otherwise a lot of them were saved from the tourist industry and the logging industry. So they might come in with some um, different injuries of sorts, but we were able to help clean them and keep them healthy in that sense. Um, the other one was a little puppy on the right. He was my first stitch up patient um, oh, yeah. with his little e-collar e on in that little right hand corner. And he was doing well afterwards on that time. So that was my first exciting little stitch up. So what do you mean by stitch up? Like I uh, so you had to do surgery on him and then... Stitch. I believe with that one, it was a little bit of a bite wound. So there was a little open hole through his skin. Um, that just needed a couple of stitches to close up so it could heal appropriately later on. Oh, wow. Yeah. You look very excited after that first experience. <laughs> <laughs> very happy. And who's this guy down here? That's the same puppy. So ah. he's in recovery, just waking up, Beautiful. showing us uh, his cute little face. <laughs> All right. We'll go to the next slide. Um, it looks like some more fun. What's happening here? Definitely. So the picture on the left hand side, this is working with cattle. Um, we're trimming their hooves. So sometimes their 
claws get a bit too long or they might have a lameness that's happening. So this is a very common way to um, get them into a crush and get their leg out so you have access to their foot to have a really good look at what's going on. Um, and here you can see that I'm, I believe it's sanding down um, her claws just to make sure they're nice and even and comfortable when she's walking. The middle picture is from one of our surgery practice that we were practicing scrubbing in and staying sterile. Um, we're all, at this point, obviously you can see that we're able to take pictures because um, we were using stuffed animals to practice on and everything. Huh? So yeah, it's more, look it's at funny. us, we're looking, <laughs> looking like real vets here yeah. um, in the theater. And then the picture on the right is just one of the horses that was in during one of my rotations in final year. He had a lameness in that back right leg that you can see him lifting up a little bit. And he was a little cheeky monkey where he'd go and try to bite your pant leg when you weren't looking and then afterwards would stick out his tongue. So I was able to capture a <laughs> cheeky little picture when he did that. Ah, uh, yep. And I can see you're speaking out your tongue as well. <laughs> yep. <laughs> oh, awesome. Um, wow, it looks like here we've got a really young calf that's just been born is that correct yeah so that one was i believe uh at the university one of the cows was in calf um, and she was struggling a little bit so us as a group of young vets and with our um, professor went out to the field and helped her deliver the calf oh what an experience yeah. and what about over here what's happening yeah and that one that was a little baby goat that one was uh i believe surrendered um, to one of the homes that I was able to do placement at. So they were just finding another new home for it um, later on. So there was a couple of them that were hanging out at, at that shelter. Yeah. So we've gone through like quite a wide range of animals. So you obviously have to learn about the science and the physiology and the anatomy and all the pathophysiology. So the disease about a whole wide range of animals is that correct definitely definitely so with the setup of how melbourne does their veterinary medicine school um it is more general the first year or two and then it does get into more specifics in that third and fourth year i guess more species specific with different disease processes and treatments and things like that wow so much to learn and this looks like more elephants, is that? Yep, more elephants. So a lot of times with animals, they do respond quite well with positive reinforcement. And what's more positive than some yummy food and treats? So as you can <laughs> see in that picture on the left, we're giving the elephant bananas one by one as the elephant's getting its foot cleaned from a previous injury. And that can be a daily to um, twice a day cleaning just to keep all the mud and gunk out. Um, oh, so that's what you're doing over here? Yeah. Cool. Must be your favorite, the elephant. They're, they're so much fun. They're so cool. Such amazing creatures that I would suggest to anybody if they ever want to do any animal handling or just volunteer work that working with elephants has been a game changer for me. It's amazing just like looking into their eyes and seeing and feeling their emotion and their soul basically. It's a yeah. weird experience, but it's so, so cool. Um, on the left there is another elephant. As you can see, she is reaching into the tub of where the food is. Yeah. So more positive reinforcement. They have taught her to kneel down so then we can scrub the bottom of her back foot as you can see the other people doing on the side. And then the one on the right, he had a, he's a little um, baby elephant and he had a foot injury as well. So we had to clean his foot and he'd just hang out by the bar as we gave him treats too. And he'd be a little cheeky as well, as you see him posing. <laughs> so would they, elephants have a, um, you said you're cleaning out the bottom of their foot. Do they have a, um, a lot of problems with their um, hooves and feet and things like that? Typically in the wild, they wouldn't, but if they were happen to walk around where 
the old war zones may have been where old landmines may have been buried and never found again and they happen to step on one um that would be one of the main ways or get caught in traps and things like that where they'd get mm-hmm. injuries yeah um, possibly you know from the logging industry as well like hauling logs day in and day out um from wear and tear and falling injuries stuff like that and being such a large animal and a large creature it not only takes a lot of medication to treat them but it does take a lot of time as well because you can't just put their foot in a bandage and say okay hop around on three legs now because they're just such big creatures so they still have to use unfortunately their injured legs still but it's just trying to stay on top of the infection and the injury itself so each day is a small battle to win and it may take longer to heal yeah oh wow all right so now we're going to move into so i guess a lot of those photos were where, from when you were still um, learning to become a vet so how Correct. long did you say it took you again was it six years to become a vet so it, at melbourne it was four years for me because i did it as a postgraduate and where so, other people can do the fast track one that's six years total yeah wow so a lot of time and so, so technically can, for me it took me nine years of schooling yeah to become a vet <laughs> <laughs> and i'm sure it was worth it though definitely every minute um so now we're going to get into so how long have you been practicing as a vet now um it will be coming up to about three years this december yeah. Wow. And so now we're going to go through some of your first year um, real cases. Is that correct? Yeah. Some of the ones that stuck out for me and were made a big impact with my learning. Cool. Okay. So case one, what do we have here? This is a dog. This dog is sedated. Um, and if we look very, very closely, what you can see in the eye, the cornea of the eye, oh, yep, right there, yep. that is a grass seed. Oh, yeah, I can see that now through here. So he's just yep. been playing in the park or something like that, and it's... Yeah, it must have been running through some long grass and got a grass seed stuck in his eye, and it migrated and got stuck in the cornea, which is that front part of your eye, the clear bit. Yeah. Um, and what we did is we pulled out the grass seed and gave him not only systemic antibiotics, but also eye ointment to help heal his eye up. So is this quite a common occurrence that happens or is it like a rare? In the eyeball, not necessarily, yeah. <laughs> very rare, but grass seeds are quite common. So we do see a good handful of cases each year where you'll find grass seeds down ears of dogs. You'll find them in their coat. You might find them... Um, They might come in with a lameness or a lump on their foot where the grass seed has gone underneath the skin and then starts migrating up. Um, I think I've seen one, I've seen a grass seed stuck in a tooth, like in the gum before. Um, And they, they can travel anywhere. So if the dog accidentally even like sniffs the ground with grass seeds like that around, they could sniff it up their little nose and possibly into the airway too. So it can be quite serious. And we do want to try to catch them as fast as we can because the grass seeds, as you may or may not know, they do have little barbs at the end. So they are really good in going one direction, but very hard going the other direction. So they, that's why they migrate so well. Oh, cool. All right. And oh my God, what is happening here? I hope our, vis- our listeners aren't very queasy. Yeah, so these are pictures of what's called a pyometra. It's basically an infected uterus. So this is unfortunately quite common in older intact females, meaning that if they haven't, have not been de-sexed when they're younger or middle age, this is a common occurrence that may happen um, where when they do come on heat, um, they might not have a good cycle when they're older and their uterus gets infected. And once it does, it can make them quite ill. And one of the treatments that's pretty foolproof at making them feel better is 
desexing them and removing their uterus and ovaries. So as the pictures show, um, the big bulgy bits, I suppose you could say, <laughs> that's the uterus that has the infection in them. Yeah. Oh, yeah. And what about over here? That one's the same type of thing. Um, that was actually my second surgery I've done with that type of um, case. Um, yeah. And that one, it was, I believe the staffy when she first came in, weighed about 18 and a half kilos. And by the time we removed the, her uterus um, and the pyometra, she weighed about somewhere between 16 kilos so it was quite oh, heavy and big the two kilos around two kilos less yeah wow. and so you've obviously saved their lives by doing this surgery so. yeah yeah I'm at, at this too. point i think they're going well <laughs> yeah <laughs> and what else do we have what do we have here this looks like an x-ray of a dog is it yep Yep, that would be a dog x-ray on that left-hand side. Um, and as you can may or may not see in the x-ray, there is something that's a little bit big. Looks like it's the same color as the leg bones and the spine. Is that it here? Uh, yep, yep, right there. That's located in a bladder of a dog that was urinating um, blood and wasn't feeling so well. So we uh, took an image of the of the dog and found that she had a bladder stone. Oh, um, yeah. She was then admitted for surgery that day. And on the right hand side is the two little bladder stones that were found in there. So that's a pen next to it just to see how big it was. Yeah. And she was able to go home the next day, nice and happy and well. Wow. And so relieved. <laughs> is it actually a stone or is it something else? Um, so bladder stones can form from different crystals as well. So I believe we sent that one off to get tested and it was a struvite um, based stone. Um, a lot of them come out different shapes and sizes. Typically the struvite stones, they are quite smooth and circular. So it does look like a pebble, like a legit outside pebble. Yeah. Where some, of them, some of them can come out looking like star shapes and things like that. So it's really, really neat. Yeah. Not so good for the patient, but really cool to see yeah all right another x-ray here the case five yeah so this one unfortunately wasn't one of the happy-go-lucky cases um this dog came in presenting with a soft cough and not feeling so well at home pretty lethargic slowing down a bit and the cough kept getting worse over time so by the time we saw this animal um, we not only treated it with some antibiotics initially just to see if it would clear up or not, but it wasn't getting any better. So we decided to move forth with some x-rays. We took an image of its chest. And as you see um, in the chest, you can see the ribs coming down on the side. Yep. You can Basically. see the heart in the middle where your mouse was. Yeah. Yep. Right there. Yeah. And Throughout that area is where the lung lobes live. And as you can see next to the metal marker that has an R on it, that's the color that we see on x-rays that's metal. And next to it is black and that should be air. Typically lungs, when they're nice and healthy, they should be almost see-through like the black on the side. Or unfortunately with this dog, you can see little white circles all throughout the lungs we'll and that's in, yeah and that's indicative of potentially of a cancer that has spread to its lungs so unfortunately this animal had a cancer didn't figure out what type but um it was to the point where it was it was you know not doing so well and unfortunately it does happen in the time where um clients may have to make that decision for euthanasia. So unfortunately this one was put down in the end. Yeah, that's so tough. Um, but I guess it's something that you have to deal with quite a bit, um, trying to talk to the clients about whether um, putting the animal down is the best thing for it. How do you um, get through that sort of stuff? 
So a lot of times um, there's many different options that you can present. You can try to do, you know, everything you can possible. Um, sometimes there are limitations and restrictions you do have to realize. And from there, it would be, you know, going through those options and seeing basically what's the quality of life that we have present. Um, are we still enjoying the little things, our toys, our walks? Um, are we still eating and drinking and getting up and moving around, um, doing our favorite things? Are we able to, you know, keep food down when they do eat? Um, are they toileting normally or not? And those are different things we do have to base off their quality of life. And mm -hmm. if different aspects are deteriorating where if, for example, with this dog, if the dog was getting up and down throughout the night, barely sleeping, always coughing, um, not feeling well and barely eating and drinking, then we do have that choice um, in the veterinary world to present with euthanasia, which is basically a peaceful ending to stop the suffering that they may be going through. So, yeah. Okay. So what's happening here in case six? So this one, this one was a, another case that was a bit, basically another um, euthanasia case where they, with the image, there has been a bone cancer that has formed in that humerus. So it is a front leg. Um, and is, when you say humerus, is this this bit here? Or? Yep. 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 Um, there's some irregularities throughout that bone. And as you can see, there is a lighter gray area around the bone as well that looks like a lump. And that's what this dog presented as was this huge mass that formed oh. Oh, to the right a little bit. Yeah more to the right, like outside the bone. Oh, like this. Yeah, so yeah. that area, yeah. Oh. So that was, when you saw the dog, it looked like a big, like almost base, baseball to softball sized lump under the skin. Uh, okay, yeah. And when you felt it, it was quite hard and painful as well. So we took x-rays and this is what we saw. It was another bone cancer basically um, that is highly aggressive and very painful. So many times, more often than not, even if you did do the gold standard treatment of, you know, leg amputation, chemotherapy, radiotherapy, um, and all these different things, the lifespan of this, if it didn't already spread, um, would still be maybe six months to 18 months. So um, there are some sinister things out there that um, unfortunately we do run into and I believe they kept her on pain relief. So she was going good on pain relief for about a week or two, but then it got too much where even high doses of pain relief wasn't enough to ease the pain. And yeah, the decision was made to euthanize her. Oh, okay. And is um, cancer something that is quite common in animals that you find? Now that they are living longer, just like humans, um, it is something we do run into as they age. So different breeds have different predispositions. So um, for example, larger breed dogs, they might not live as long in general. So, you know, you're looking at the four, eight, 10 year mark, maybe 15. And when they do get older in these cases, um, that unfortunately neoplasia or cancer does move up the list as they age. So even with the smaller dogs, they may live up to 20 years old but as soon as they do hit those elderly ages of 10 years plus even, um, when they do come down with symptoms of not eating, not drinking, losing weight, um, possibly inappropriate behaviors too, it's something to consider that might be going on. So that's where further investigation with um, looking at bloods and urine and doing these x-rays and possibly even further investigation with ultrasounds, um, CTs, MRIs, different modalities in that sense to figure out what's going on. Um, it's helpful to put the pieces together. Yeah. And so you said CT, does that mean a CAT scan? Is that what you're... Yeah. Yeah. So it's that human version of a CAT scan. Yeah. Ah, so many tools you can use. Yeah, it's now becoming more available in the vet world. Um, if you mentioned these 20 years ago or even 10, 15 years ago, they probably weren't an option then. 
Um, yeah. It's just more recently, in the past five, ten years, where they have become more available to animal use um, for further diagnostics and even research. Yeah. Oh, cool. <laughs> and I can see Daisy again in K7. And so oh, yes. what happened here? K7. Miss Daisy. Um, this is when I came back from my holidays back home. Um, I decided to take a nap one day. And Daisy decided to eat a basically almost a whole pan of dark, dark chocolate brownies that um. happened to be made. And... Uh, as soon as I found out, it was probably 30 minutes after she ate this, I rang up my fellow vets. I was able to get into my clinic, luckily, but I was, I was about 60 seconds away from going to emergency because dark, dark chocolate, as much dark chocolate as this picture on the right has shown, that is very, very, very deadly to dogs, um, very toxic. So I needed to get, her, get that out of her as soon as possible, made her vomit, most of it came up, luckily, and I provided or basically had all the drugs on hand just in case she did go into a heart attack or arrhythmia of sorts overnight. As you can see, I have her on a fluid drip as well to keep her nice and hydrated and had access to her um, vessel or her vein in yeah. case I did need to give her any medication. But yeah, even it not only happens to you know, the normal household animal, but it can happen to vets, animals as well. So. <laughs> and yep. so, had, so Daisy ate the muffins, not the chocolate, but the, cho the muffins contained the whole block of chocolate. Is that right? Correct. So it was, they were like chocolate muffins. <laughs> yeah. Oh, wow. Naughty Daisy. <laughs> I'm sure she thought it tasted really good, but I did <laughs> not. <laughs> Uh, and so I've moved the slide on because um, this is something about what you do, um, I guess, to relieve yourself from being a vet um, because, you know, it's a very um, tight, like as you've gone through, it's a very tiring job. Um, you know, it's not nine to five at all. Um, if you have a client with a, a sick animal that comes up at five to five, um, you can't say, sorry, we're closed, can you? You've got to... Um, stay behind and try and work out what's wrong with that animal. Um, yep, 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 especially if it's an emergency case. Um, they take priority anywhere at any clinic, um, and you, tr you do what you can do to at least stabilize them. Um, the clinics that I have worked at, we are not a 24-hour clinic, so a lot of times we will stabilize the animal. We can give the owners options of going to emergency for further workup or monitoring overnight. Or potentially, depending on the case, they could stay at our plate, our hospital or other clinics overnight, but there's no supervision. So as long as the owners are aware of that, um, it's very important to let them know the options. Or unless they're doing okay and they're stable enough, the owners have the option to take their animal home with them so they can monitor overnight and they can always bring them back the next day for re-monitoring and um, reassessment as well so yeah yeah well I just admire what you're able to do um but you obviously need to have some some time out um away from it all so um this is what you do is it to to relax and take your mind away definitely I've always been involved in sports my whole life ever since I was a little girl um started with ballet believe it or not and then <laughs> transformed into many different sports so since being in Australia, I've picked up beach volleyball and have loved it ever since. So as you can see on the picture on the left-hand side, this is me and one of the, my partners that I played with. Um, we won a tournament in Canberra, um, so that was exciting. And then on the right was just one of the pictures that um, was taken during a tournament here in Melbourne, enjoying the sunshine, getting some my tan on, <laughs> but also having fun. Oh, awesome. And I guess, because um, I'm interviewing you today as a parasitologist, that I actually know you from playing volleyball. That's how we met. <laughs> volleyball. <laughs> That's during the indoor seasons. Yeah, lots of fun. Um, so I'm going to stop the slideshow now.
um, and just ask you a couple more questions before um, we let you go. Um, because this is, you've just got home from work, so I'm sure you just want to have a rest and a lay down and eat lots of ice cream, whatever you do to unwind. Um, so what do I want to ask I've you? had some of that already. <laughs> yeah. What are you wearing? Is that what you wear to work? Yeah, so this is my scrub top that I wore today. Um, I have a couple different really cool designed ones and bright colored ones just to keep um, the positivity and me being me, I like bright, colorful things as well, um, just to express myself at my clinic. So yeah, this one is uh, Love Earth and Recycle. Oh, that's great messages. Um, I wanna ask you two questions. Um, because it's National Science Week um, and because I'm interviewing you as a parasitologist, I of course want to know what your favorite parasite is. Um, and also, um, so there are some, some listeners out there that um, have listened to this interview and say, wow, that's pretty, pretty cool. I want to become a vet. What would be one thing you might um, tell them about trying to be a vet? Sure. So my favorite parasite so far, I would have to say probably the household flea. <laughs> <laughs> it's easy to treat. Um, they're pretty cool in the sense that a lot of times you don't see them. You just see the dog being itchy. So it's about, I believe, 90 to 95% of them, eggs, larvae, adult fleas, live in the environment itself. So the only time when you really do see the fleas on animals is when there's a really big infestation happening and they're very, very itchy. Um, and that's just by you know going through their coat, you might see them scurry away. Or yeah. you might see some flea dirt, which is basically flea poo, and it looks like little pieces of dirt on their skin. Yeah. Um, I might, because um, I actually, I study a roundworm um, of sheep, but um, yes, I have grown my own fleas um, when I haven't done pa good parasite control on my animals. <laughs> but I was really amazed that the flea can actually carry um, a, a type of tapeworm. Is that right? Correct. Yeah. So... Not only can the dog flea and the cat flea jump back and forth between species, but they also can carry a tapeworm. So if the animal is itchy and they're scratching themselves with their mouth, and they accidentally eat a flea and they're not treated for intestinal worms as well, they can develop tapeworm. And then you'll start seeing them out the other end. <laughs> <laughs> Definitely seeing that as well. <laughs> um, and then, yeah, the last question I would just... Do you have what sort of advice might you have for people that are aspiring to be a vet like yourself? Follow your dreams and your goals. Um, it's a very satisfying job. If you love the animals and you love a challenge, definitely look forward into it. There's many different options in the veterinary medicine world. You don't have to be just a dog and cat vet. You can be a horse vet, cow vet, sheep vet, um, exotic vet, research. Um, you can work in the drug industry. You can work government you can work viral um yeah which i'm sure a lot of vets are on with this whole covid thing that's happening because as we know it got transferred from animal to person so figuring out that side of things um that's where vets can be involved as well so there's many many different pathways and um, job opportunities when you become a vet and not you don't have to be stuck in just the clinical aspect of it yeah wow well. Never really thought about it like that, but that's really good. That's some really good advice. So um, lastly, I just want to say thanks again for joining us because I know you've been super flat out work. Um, you were going to join us um, tomorrow live, but um, you've got six surgeries to do tomorrow. Yeah, potentially six, if not maybe a couple more. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> well, good oh. luck with that. And um, yeah, thanks again. Thank you for having me. Enjoy your week and I hope you learn a lot and enjoy all the science. And if um, anyone has any questions, they can just pop them down in the comment after the video and um, we'll get back to them with, with the answers, won't we? Yep. Awesome. Thanks very much, Anna. I'll see you later. See ya.